Why, hello, hello. This is Rumor, and I am back with the last installment that I will inflict upon you, at least for a while, on my Spike deck, which I've called Fool for Tarot in honor of that Fool for Love. But as I have been promising, I am going to follow up here sharing the remainder of the deck walkthrough with the Minor Arcana. So to get those out then from where we left off, I will share with you the numbered pips and the court cards. The pip style cards are just that, and I will show those in conjunction with the traditional writer Waite Smith to show how that inspired my arrangement of the images, but keeping it pretty simple and basic with that, so be right back with that. Right, okay, so for this side-by-side -side comparison, I will be using the Centennial version of the Rider Waite Smith deck, and I think it's pretty straightforward with the aces. For my wand suit, using a cigarette, however, instead of the wand, and just keeping it that, I didn't embellish with any additional imagery uh, because I'm lazy. These are lazy pips. Yeah, I said it. But uh, of course I wanted to go with the cigarettes because Spike loves to smoke them so much. Uh, even though uh, vampires in the Buffy universe supposedly can't breathe, but I, I tend to take that to mean like they don't need to breathe in the oxygen from the air to then like process into the bloodstream in order to survive. I'm assuming, though, that kind of like, um, uh, what do they call those things that you like stoke a fire with or like a turkey baster, <laughs> you know, where you've got like suction and it can suck in the air and then like blow it back out. I assume that a vampire body can still function like that. So whether he actually gets any sort of like nicotine buzz from the cigarettes, I really not sure about that. But anyway, I've talked way too long on that. Look how hard I try to reconcile the inconsistencies that can show up in that show. <laughs> but anyways, uh, making my disclaimer for the millionth time, every time I've discussed this deck and shown this suit, the British slang term for cigarettes is fag. So Spike in his voice would not be saying cigs. Please do not be offended. This is not intended as a derogatory term. That's not my intention in any way, shape, or form. So anyway, the basic ace of fags. For the two, also, just basic. The two side by side evoking this image. The three not strictly following it, but because I'm not incorporating scenery, this idea of a horizon there, I positioned these in this way to show the expansiveness of the three. With the four, again, not arranged exactly here, but I did try to not just have them all in a row, trying to show a sense of like perspective with like two in the background to form these posts. With the five, this gets a little bit more in keeping. Again, not a wand for cigarette match in the exact positioning, but you still get the idea of the this overlap and tangle of the cigarettes. And then the one that is kind of just outside of it, because I wanted a representation there of sort of staying outside of this fray, which can often come across in five of wands for me. I've got my phone plugged in and just managed to yank the cord. So if the uh, positioning here is a little different, that's why I had to fix it. 
But uh, Six of Wands, again, not wand for wand match, but just this idea of recognition. This wand that is being held aloft would be this highest cigarette here. And I guess just kind of showing the shape of like this guy being on horseback. And also the idea to um, more figuratively working up to an accomplishment such as this, where you get that external kind of recognition. Uh, But to follow something like that, you know, there's always like the aftermath and starting back where you began back to the drawing board with something else then. This is minor arcana. So these are the achievements that can be maybe a relatively short-lived thing. And so I just wanted to show that sense that you don't want to rest on your laurels for too long. There could be something else that comes about, that kind of knocks you down a peg, and you must begin again. Oops. Where is my seven? Oh, I got those out of order. My bad. Okay. So here we see the other cigarettes that are attacking this one, and that is the one being held as we hold our ground and defend ourselves against the onslaught. Very unoriginally going with (laughs) the Eight of Wands shape here. I do not typically love this image. I wish there could be a little bit more to it, but I mean, for lack of (laughs) thinking of anything better to do with these cigarettes, again, I just wanted to still retain that nod to the RWS, so I did keep them in here at this angle. Now for the nine, here is our little defensive wall, little fence we've built with the cigarettes, and then this one kind of blocking that gap as we hang on. We've been through it. (laughs) We've had our ass handed to us, but we're still Got our defenses, maybe hiding behind this wall for a bit just to get a breather, uh, kind of lick our wounds, but um, but still like in the seven, holding our ground there, getting ready to fight again another day. And then for the 10, just decided to have them splayed all around like this to show this bundle, this burden we must sometimes carry. So now more akin to the major cards where I had an actual image from the show to convey the court cards. So in approaching the courts, because this is a spike focused deck, all of the court members are different facets of Spike. I did not go with different characters here. They are all him at different stages of his journey, showing different aspects of his character, his personality, and so forth. For the page, though, and for this, I've switched to this kind of visual at the bottom since I'm not necessarily using the cigarettes in these images. It's still denoted here, so I know what suit is what. But we see the page here embarking on something, you know, sort of seizing that wand from the Ace of Wands with that initial spark of inspiration and actually picking it up and about to do something with it. And I saw that kind of initiative here when Spike, this is him in his car, as we saw uh, from the front in the chariot card. He has just run over the Sunnydale sign for the first time. (laughs) Because as we all know, he does it again. (laughs) But um, this is like for the first time when he's coming to Sunnydale. This was him taking the initiative when he and Drusilla basically got attacked by a mob and Drusilla is greatly weakened in that confrontation. And so Spike is thinking that perhaps bringing her to the hell mouth, this source of 
energy could be something that revives her. So he's just like going to the source and kind of taking that into his own hands and thus begins his journey now in this new life and arc that he will be living through in Sunnydale. And for the court cards, an element that I've added in that's special to them is a brief uh, word or phrase either quoting from the show or paraphrasing. Uh, as I've mentioned before, when I talked through the majors, I didn't want to be too overtly taking from the show. I mean, it's obvious, I guess, <laughs> what it is and what I'm depicting here. But, you know, I'm not taking images directly from the show. I'm using stock photos that I'm used to approximate those things. And um, accordingly, uh, as an editor, I know that there's only so much in a text that you can directly quote without infringing on copyright. And so I went with words, phrases that are pretty like ordinary enough. So I just thought it would be fun to add another element in and also if it could help to clarify specifically what I'm trying to evoke here and why I think it's appropriate for this card. But here we see Spike coming in and making a new home for himself as he embarks on this page's journey. But he's got lots to learn from this point, lots of growth that stems from this point. We don't yet see and he doesn't quite know yet what he is going to do. But as he progresses into the Knight of Wands, I have chosen his <laughs> combat boots. He is a man of action, even when he has his chip and he can't harm humans anymore without that extreme pain. And so he takes his fight out on the demons, which is coming from that scene where he realizes that, that he can hurt demons, just not humans. And he's trying to get Xander and Willow up off the couch away from the TV to go out and annihilate something. And so he's like, come on. So it's just that kind of like active energy, like, yeah, rearing for the fight. For the Queen of Wands, uh, this is fast forwarding a bit to, is it season six when Spike and Buffy have like started screwing around, uh, but then they stopped, but then he comes to get his lighter, which she has found in the cushions of her sofa, I think, and is saying to her, I'm getting what I came for, but that fire element for the wands here. Uh, and that that just kind of um, attitude, I'm getting what I came for. I see that in the queen of wands. She knows what she wants and how to get it. I just look at this lighter and I see that like spark of passion also being the thing that can ignite uh, one's inner creativity and uh, the more inward world too of um, passionate feeling and interacting in a relationship. So for the King of Wands, if this is the page the first time Spike takes down a Sunnydale sign, this is the last time he does. This is Spike completing his journey and quoting him, I want to see how it ends when he is down in the Hellmouth wearing the amulet, which has channeled the sunlight and beamed it out and is destroying all of the uber vamps and Spike as a vampire as well in the process. And that is him, again, got that fiery energy of the amulet channeling the sun, literally burning him to dust, but he is seeing it through. And that's the kind of follow through that the King of Wands would also have, you know, he, he's in this to win it and he's going to see it through to the end. And he does. And I thought it would be fun rather than just saying, welcome to Sunnydale. Uh, Cause it's a different type of sign at the end that we see that falls into the big pit that's been created when all of Sunnydale collapses. <laughs> I thought it'd be more fun to have the hell mouth. Does it all show up here? Because not all of the sign shows up here, but as if it's been written in blood. So anyway, that's just me having fun. 
for the first episode of Buffy from season one called Welcome to the Hellmouth. So now getting into our swords suit, my swords are spikes, railroad spikes, which allegedly give Spike his name when he has renamed himself after becoming a vampire and he doesn't want to go by William anymore. He is no longer posh. He changes his accent, in fact, to sound a bit more uh, urban and streetwise. And yeah, so here we go again with our basic ace image of just the single Spike. Two of spikes showing this crisscross as we see with the arms and the swords here. This decision of which option to follow, which path to take. The three of spikes. Thankfully, for the love of God, not having to show them piercing a heart, as we always freaking see, <laughs> but, um, but still evoking the positioning of them as they do so in the traditional writer Waite Smith. Emotion and thought can be very closely tied together. The emotion can beget the thoughts. The thoughts can beget the emotion. And either way, when we're processing something, even if it is emotional, we need to find growth from that and that coming from the three. It's always something that we learn and grow from. For the four of spikes here, just positioning these like the swords on the wall, and then this one just showing that sense of repose, that rest, that timeout that we get in the four of swords collect ourselves after a bit of a break. I did try to arrange these as the swords appear in this card. So the two that he's holding in that hand, the one holding in the other, and then the other two that are just laying on the ground, kind of shaking up that energy, lacking the symmetry of the other cards and just showing that shake up of the fives numerically, whatever the suit. The six, I didn't follow the shape of the swords here, but evoking the boat by showing as if we're like on it and looking towards the bow of it. So that just sort of pointed shape there and almost as like these guiding posts leading us out of these more tumultuous waters into the smoother, perhaps safer, calmer one. It's just, it's that forward journey. This again, though, I am trying to mirror what we see in the RWS, the swords that are being carried away versus the two that are left staked in the ground. Still lacking a symmetry, though, a seven being that other shakeup, introducing more conflict numerically. The eight, I have positioned mine in a circle like the cage created by the swords here, but of course, leaving that gap in the front here, because as we see in the RWS 8, there is always that way out. Uh, if we are willing to open our eyes and get out of our thoughts and free ourselves from that cage of our own making. So I wanted to allow that space here also. Nine of spikes, not so cleverly, just arranging them the best way I could fit nine railroad spikes onto this card. <laughs> and it really was easiest to just kind of stack them like this, but uh, did not have them all pointing one way just so I could kind of stagger. And again, just get it to fit. <laughs> But that kind of like block there, I mean, I feel like it does evoke for me a sense of just like, boom, how that like just fear can just really um, also kind of stall you like in, we get in the eight, just that it, it just creates that block in your head mentally. And with the 10, yeah, just trying to fit all these in that cluster, it just, it shows a, a very full and cluttered mind for me. And that overload, you're just kind of hitting rock bottom with the situation. Like 
your mind has analyzed this thing to death. It is just way too full and yeah, you just kind of need to like put an end to that, clear the thought, get a clearer mind. So now with the page, as we are entering into the mental realm with Spike, I thought of, again, early in his Sunnydale journey, when he sends another vampire out with a camcorder, <laughs> very 90s style camcorder, to tape Buffy as she is fighting a vamp when she's out on patrol. And then he brings it back and we see Spike watching it and having his uh, minion replay it over and over and over again. So I've got here, rewind that, because uh, he is watching her moves on the offensive, defensive, over and over and over, studying her. Because I often see the Page of Swords as a student, and he is trying to get a sense of how the Slayer fights, what moves he could anticipate if he were to take her on. And so this is just very studious of him. It is very smart. It is very diligent. And we've got our little spike, railroad spike here. And I love the, uh, <laughs> just the nostalgia of this. I mean, yeah, those of us of a certain age, lived through it. <laughs> Look at how pixelated the writing on here is too. And like that terrible tracking that would happen on a videotape. For the, for the youngins that didn't watch VHS tapes on a video cassette recorder, you would see somewhere usually the time and date of the footage as it was being recorded. And then this over here on the right was just showing the clock on the VCR as it's playing for how long that footage lasted. So anyways, I've got it at two minutes, six seconds, purely because this was episode six of season two. And um, I believe that Buffy originally aired, at least in central time, I think it was 7 p.m. So I chose that. And then this episode, well, wait a minute. Actually, no, I don't think the episode aired on this date. I think this is when Spike is actually watching the footage because I calculated it as being um, two days before Halloween. So that would have been October 29th in 1997. <laughs> so anyways, getting way too into this for such a basic image that I used. Knight of Swords, as we kind of take this like studious page who's like learning, this is like preparing for the action. We then see this Knight of Swords going all balls out, ready for action, taking those ideas, championing a cause and going out and making that difference. And so I saw that kind of energy in Spike when he is seeking the Gem of Amara. And this is not the Gem of Amara. This is a stock photo image that I managed to find to just represent that ring that Spike knows from vampire lore that if someone wears it, uh, the legend is that they should be able to go into the sunlight without getting dusted. This is a case where Spike is also doing his due diligence. He has done his studies on this gem not just in learning about it and what it can do, but in trying to find where it's located. And he has found where in Sunnydale it is. And so if you watch this episode where he's looking for the ring, he is constantly studying blueprints, um, much to Harmony's dismay, who's his girlfriend at the time. And, you know, she just wants to like make out, make love with him. She wants to go out. She wants to travel. She wants to do things, man. But Spike says, no, you know, she's got to be an indoor kitty now because they're trying to keep a low profile as he uh, hires other vampires, uh, maybe some other kinds of demons to help him dig and look for this ring. And so he is fixated. He's got 
this one goal in mind and it comes at the cost of his relationship with Harmony because he is very neglectful of her. He's got a one track mind on this goal. And as he tells her, he's got work to do. The Queen of Swords. I've got a mashup going on here between my image and the quote, but I did so because I felt that both instances were essentially conveying the same trait of Spikes as I see him embodying the Queen of Swords. And that is that Spike is very perceptive. He sees things that others don't typically, and he does so with an emotional depth and insight, which I think the queen, even being of the air, I think she also has an emotional component going on there in, in how she um, has come to perceive things and impart her knowledge. And so what I've done here, I've got the stethoscope to represent Ben, the doctor, and the red pump to represent Glory, the goddess who lives inside Ben, has to share a body with Ben. So what Spike actually says here, uh, instead of are you blind, there's a very funny scene where he is the only one who remembers that Ben is Glory and Glory is Ben. <laughs> and... He's looking at the others like, well, you saw it, right? You, you were here. You, you, you saw it. Like, and, 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 and he explains it to them and, and they'll catch on to it for a moment. Like, wait a minute. So are you saying that Ben is glory and glory is Ben? And he's like, yes, right. It just happened in front of you. You saw it. And then I think it's Giles that a second later is like, yes. But do we think that perhaps there's a connection between Glory and Ben? And Spike realizes like, oh my God, they've like forgotten this again. So he, what he actually says is, are you all very stoned? Like he doesn't understand why this is happening until he does, because he is smart and perceptive enough to realize like, oh, I see. There's a handy little spell here that prevents people from remembering this. That's clever, isn't it? But then what I've quoted here is from an earlier time in season four, when Willow is so heartbroken over her breakup with Oz and him leaving town. And Spike is, oddly enough, the only one that can see how deeply she is hurting. Uh, the Scoobies, Buffy herself, like, they're kind of blowing Willow off. Like, they know that she's sad and upset, but they're not really, like, seeing it for as, um, as like, deep as the depression and the grief is. And they just think, like, oh, yeah, I think she's getting better. And Spike's the one sitting there saying, like, are you blind? She's doing terribly. Like, she's not, she's not getting any better. And uh, so, again, just another instance that shows, like, that perceptiveness that, that Spike has. So I guess what I felt was debatable with the whole bed and glory thing is that it's like literally the spell that is keeping like the Scoobies from seeing what happened with that transition. And that's only because of being a vampire is why Spike is able to see that. But he does just have that like emotional intelligence to see things and uh, kind of call the Scoobies out on it. And it's great. It's a big part of why I love him so much. And yeah, I've banged on about that one enough, haven't I? But then now for the king. Got a pool cue here and quoting Spike as saying, lesson the first. I feel like this is a culmination of this suit where... student becomes the teacher. And this is from where Spike is teaching Buffy because she's asked him to. He's telling her how he was able to kill two slayers before because Buffy has, has, an, has had an encounter with a vampire where she's gotten really injured and she's just realizing more fully her own mortality. She's lived longer than most slayers by that point in season five. And she wants to know more about how 
any Slayer had been killed. And unfortunately, when she goes to Giles, there's like very little in the Watcher's diaries over time about that. So she can't get the information she needs from that avenue. So she goes to Spike himself who has experience killing two slayers. And so they're at the bronze and he's playing pool at first before they go out to the alley and he commences this like training. And it's just really cool to see him showing her what his strategy was in that fight and helping her learn what moves maybe to anticipate. And he's telling her like, you have to reach for your weapon whether it's the stake or the crossbow, a sword, whatever it might be, um, whereas he's already got his, his ability to just vamp out on command and have his fangs. But anyways, that idea of being like the teacher, you know, who has mastered this and can teach his strategy. Um, uh, it's very King of Swords. So now we get into the cups suit. Which I have chosen cups of cocoa for. When we see Spike, uh, he has left Sunnydale at the end of season two, but when he returns in season three, heartbroken over Drusilla, he is at Buffy's house and Joyce has given him some hot cocoa to make him feel better. And he asks her if she's got the mini marshmallows to put in there. So cup of cocoa. <laughs> The cup for this deck. For the two of Coco, I've arranged them as if they are coming together in this partnership, in this union. And instead of the marshmallows, we see that little barista art of the hearts. Love, romantic love that we can see in this, or at the very least, just that partnership, a sense of collaboration. For the three now, we see that group t coming together, celebrating together, finding your tribe, kind of spirit of that. Cups of cocoa being held as if about to toast. For the four, uh, trying to show the um, whether you see it as apathy or it is just like this emotional timeout happening. I've got instead of these handles being held on the outside and coming together to toast as if with a group, these handles are being pulled inward now as this person just needs that time to themselves. So there is not anyone else there other than, you know, this hand that's offering this opportunity here. But, um, but otherwise, this is just showing that sort of going within and, um, and, and taking a break and finding some um, stability in emotion, perhaps. I don't always see this as an apathetic moment, just sort of like, I need a break. I just kind of need some time to myself and just kind of collect my emotions here and, and have more of a stable foundation with them before kind of venturing out again and, and, and seizing what these opportunities could be. But, um, but of course, there is that option being held there. With the five, I've got three empty mugs here. This one here to show that the mug is empty and these two just kind of showing where it's been like knocked over, poured out, but then you still have those two to hold on to. So whatever sense of like sadness, grief, regret we might be feeling with these, there's that which remains that we can still hold on to. Our cup is still filled to an extent. With the six, uh, in a nod to the flowers that we see being offered here, I added daisies to a couple of these cups of cocoa. Going with a very symmetrical arrangement here to show the harmony that sixes bring. And we do see the handles outward again. So this could be a coming together of people again. The flowers kind of showing the sweetness of the nostalgia that can be evoked by the six as well. At the very least, it's just sort of like a, a harmonious moment um, where you can kind of see 
perhaps like a little give and take, just like coming together and nice balance there. With the seven, that image gets a little shaken up. Um, just showing like from the stable foundation of the four, I've arranged this three, showing a sense of like the growth from that then. And then to reflect all of these options and fantasies, illusions perhaps, before this figure here, I've got different toppings on each of these cups of cocoa. So you could just go with the marshmallows or you could get sprinkles. You could have some syrup. You could get whipped cream. You can have it designed with this little swirly there or just, you know, a straight up. So um, that was supposed to be the sound of the whipped cream coming out of the can. The opportunities are endless here. So now for the eight, again, as a stable number, kind of a foundation on a foundation, that stability that we can find there. There is also that sense of walking away and moving on from that which no longer serves us. And so seeing the moon here, I wanted to evoke that with the literal moon here. And I see this as being the moon we're kind of moving on to because in the rest of the cups, it is the blood moon. And that, of course, representing like literal blood that Spike as a vampire drinks. But, you know, as we see when he has the chip, he's not able to function as a regular vampire anymore. And especially when he gets uh, his soul back, you know, he, but it happens even when he's got the chip, he starts moving onward to a higher moral ground. And so then the blood that he drinks is more so the pig's blood they can get from a butcher without causing humans harm, um, not slaughtering anything himself. He needs to drink blood to live, but the way that he's acquiring it and then the way that he is just generally choosing to live is more and more operating at that higher level of moral reasoning that I discussed when I went through the majors cards before. And yeah, so a bit away from that bloodlust that's no longer satisfying. I mean, you know, literally to live, yes, he needs that as his sustenance. But then as far as like who he is, he's, he's following a different path here. So the nine of Coco, I didn't really have the space to show all of these mugs here, as we see with this guy and his shit-eating grin, um, but at least showing it, it pip style, this handle facing this way as this like cup basically being handed to him, getting his wish. It's the fulfillment that he seeks and all the handles are turned inward. He can actually grab onto any of them. The, it's not belonging to someone else. These are all at his disposal, this emotional fulfillment for him to seize. And then the time. Kind of the best way I was able to fit <laughs> 10 cups on here rather than as this rainbow but that being said whereas again with the handles turned inward because I always see the nine as being that like personal sense of fulfillment and the 10 being something more outward that we can share with others whether it's friends family chosen family and so with these pointed inward with that nine for that more inward fulfillment, they're facing out again as something that other individuals all can each have their own and be joining them together in, in toast there and sharing in this emotional fulfillment together. So for the page, I think I might love... <laughs> the cups of cocoa suit the most in, in this deck. It definitely was the easiest one to come to me. Those other ones I really had to, I had to think through a bit more, but, um, but this was pretty clear to me. Page of Cups, starting on an emotional journey, I went right back to William, the bloody awful poet. And so here is his inkwell and pen and quoting him with 
nothing rhymes. <laughs> we first see this <laughs> human Spike before he became Spike and he's just sitting writing his poem and he's trying to find a word that will rhyme uh, evidently with bulge in it. <laughs> That's what he comes up with, effulgent. But he's like, nothing rhymes, you see. And so he is just so innocent and pure and so, 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 so naive, um, but very fanciful, filled with ideas and creativity. And no, he's not a great poet, but it doesn't stop him from doing it. He admits it himself in that episode that he knows he's not a good poet, but he's a good man. I love, love, love the choice of William the Bloody as the knight of chalices in the official Buffy deck, since the Buffy deck was fitting in all different characters. And, and I do think that he was like the best choice for that one. But for mine, because I mean, Spike is going to be all of the court cards, obviously, I felt like for his emotional journey, William was the beginning of that. So he's the page in my deck. The knight being the one taking more action. So this is the love potion that he wants Willow to make when he does return to Sunnydale, heartbroken over Drew and offered this cup of cocoa from Joyce Summers. But he very wickedly uh, kidnaps Willow and is trying to force her to make this love spell for him to get Drusilla back. He is taking action on the love he's lost to a chaos demon, as it turns out. But I've also quoted from his monologue later on to Angel and Buffy about love not being brains. It's blood. We just do see how he is this fool for love. He is so passionate. He is very romantic, but like toxically so, which could be certainly the shadow side, the reversal of the Knight of Cups. Um, Spike is very fun to analyze in this way because I think he does, his character can bring a lot of shadow to these cards. Very well captured, I thought, in that particular episode. But of course, we get more opportunities to see the kinds of actions that he takes for love. But now for the Queen of Cups, we have got for sure... Uh, <laughs> maybe the least conventional image I could have chosen for a queen of cups. Bear with me. This came about because I really was struggling to figure out a way to depict this scene in the Fool for Love episode after Spike has given Buffy the lessons on how he's killed the Slayer. That ends on a bad note <laughs> where Buffy just flings the money at him and it makes him, you know, kind of makes him cry. And uh, oh my God, that, that moment just kills me. That changed everything. I, I, that was like that episode and especially that moment when he's like collecting the money, she flew and it's kind of whimpering. It was game over for me with Spike. I mean, from that point on, he had my heart. Oh my gosh, I was such a fool for him. I loved him so much before, but that was so pivotal for me as far as like, fangirling over him properly. So anyways, to follow that, Spike is like going back to his uh, crypt and looking for his gun because he's going to go, that's it. He's going to blow Buffy's head off. And Harmony, who he's still with at the time, is telling him like the chip in your head, you're not going to be able to do that. But he's like, oh, it'll cause me a lot of pain. Yeah. But you know, it'll, that'll pass in time. It's, it doesn't necessarily stop him from actually committing the act. So he goes to Buffy's house, shows up in her backyard where she is sitting on the back porch steps crying herself because her mother is having to go back to the hospital because of this issue she has been having with a tumor in her head. And so Spike is not expecting to see Buffy so vulnerable as this. And so he's got the gun in hand, but then there's that moment where he's like about to take aim, but then he puts it down and he asks her, what's wrong? And then... She's not really answering him, but allows him to approach. And he just kind of tentatively gives her a little pat 
on the shoulder trying to show some emotional support and is just there for her. He's there if she's ready to talk. He's there for her if she never wants to. And then he just kind of takes a big inhale and exhale with her, even though, again, he doesn't breathe. <laughs> but we see him go through that motion, um, just just having this connection with her and offering the emotional support. So my first idea was to have like the porch steps here. And to be quite honest, it was just a matter of like, finding an image that I liked and being able to like present it here in a way consistent with how all of the rest of the deck was looking visually. So that's where I just decided, you know what? The rifle is of course gonna make me think of this scene. And and this was actually where I got the idea to add the, the text in for the court cards, just in case that visual couldn't quite get it through well enough on its own to better explain why I thought this was Queen of Cups, it's that moment he puts the gun down and says, what's wrong? And so the King of Cups is moving towards the culmination of this suit I take from season seven. When Spike delivers to Buffy that monologue about how, you know, she's the one, she's a hell of a woman. Buffy at this point has been kicked out of her own house by her sister, Faith, all the potential slayers, the other Scoobies who do not trust her leadership anymore. Feel that she's been a bit too much of a dictator with it, not uh, democratic enough in the process of making the decisions to go after Caleb and the first. And uh, so she she acquiesces and she leaves and she goes into a stranger's house where Spike finds her in the bedroom. And then after he delivers this wonderful soliloquy to her, basically, that gives her her morale back. It gets her to believe in herself again, just as she once had done for him, gotten him to believe in himself. He's able to give that back to her. Again, it's more emotional support. And, you know, instead of just being receptive for whatever she might want to get off her chest in this moment, you know, he he's taking the action here to outwardly express this to her and make sure she knows before this night is done that what he is saying is true. And so then she asks him if he will just stay with her and hold her that night. And so these are the pillows that they're laying against or meant to represent that when they are just laying there and he's embracing her, but that's it no strings attached. Just holding her in his arms and in his heart. So for the pentacle suit, my pentacles are the blooming onion. <laughs> we get that one plate <laughs> with a delicious dipping sauce because Spike loves the bloom and onion. Even though he does not need food to live, he just needs blood as a vampire. It seems, at least on the show Angel, that we learned that like food doesn't even like taste as good to vampires. But for whatever reason, Spike just still loves the bloom and onion. And we see him drinking beer. We see him drinking booze. The smoking, all these tangible pleasures that shouldn't do anything thing for him anymore. He still does it, whether he's just going through the motions, even if it's not actually giving a physical satisfaction, but it seems like it is. And it's like when Buffy and Spike first team up in season two, and he tells her that he wants to team up against Angelus and Drusilla to save the world because he loves the world. He likes the things in it. My God, he knows the recipe. He knows how to make the bloom and onion as he relates to Andrew. <laughs> later on in season seven. So a vamp and his onions, what can I tell ya? So for the two, again, just kind of arranging them, showing this little balancing act that goes on with the two of pentacles. The three, they are mirroring the pentacles as we see them stacked here, a growth in this physical realm. The four, again, following the shape of the pentacle on the head, in the hands, under the feet. 
just to give that nod. The five, not only arranged like the pentacles are in the stained glass window, but the plates are empty of onion and delicious dipping sauce. This card where we see this lack, a sense of poverty, we see it here as well with this empty plate. But with this shape evoking this, I always see that as that help that can be there if we just know to look for it. The six, deviating from this shape here, but what I was trying to do, these are like coming in to be received and then these are what is in the hand to be given out, if, if that makes any sense. It's just a sense trying to get a motion across of in, out, and just the reciprocity of that, that flow when you have enough to share and you can give it, um, or if you're in need of it, you can receive it from those who have it for that time. Uh, the seven, going for a pip style visual here versus that arrangement, just that once more um, solid foundation of the four and then that growth of the three added to it. And here we see actual growth, this crop that has been planted and watered and nurtured and now we see it's almost ready for the harvest not quite yet but it's time is almost there and you can start to see like the fruits of your efforts if you're willing to wait for it and so anyways that growth is evoked there the eight of onions i did go for this <laughs> linear visual here. There's six pentacles here. So I just have six completed plates of bloom and onion here. And then these two here meant to show these two here that are being worked on and refined. And I always see this, you know, as the process of honing one's craft. And so this is what if you're going to follow Spike's tip on how to make the bloom and onion, you know, these are like the steps that you can follow starting with the onion itself. And then this is we see where it's been cut in half. So it's beginning that process of how you can like slice and dice this thing to make it bloom <laughs> like a flower, ultimately frying it and being able to present it as this, these perfected blooming onions from this sort of like trial and error and working at it. For the nine, just like the daisies and the hot cocoa, it would be kind of gross to eat a rose with your blooming onion, but I wanted to convey uh, the garden here, even though these are grapes, not flowers, but just that sense of the lushness of a beautifully cultivated garden and having this chance now that you've, you've earned this ability to just sort of stop and smell the roses that you have tended to so well and just thought adding the rose at the center would be nice. And then for the 10 of onions, I did play around with this to convey this tree of life that we see here. The sense of abundance, uh, not just for ourselves as we can enjoy in the nine, but to share, whether it's future generations, leaving a legacy behind, however you interpret this card, um, that's my nod to that. <laughs> So now getting into the court cards for the suit of Bloomin' Onions. For the Page of Pentacles. <laughs> oh boy, I've got my work cut out for me explaining this one. <laughs> but for the, for the Page of Onions, I've chosen Kitten Poker. Even though this happens late, you know, not at a like chronologically early time in Spike's growth arc. But, um, well, first of all, with the kittens, that sense of like youth and innocence for the page. But then also like just the idea with this page of sort of like seizing opportunity and being resourceful in a physical material way 
we think of poker, I mean, you're playing for money. Or in the case of the demons, in the case of Spike, they're playing for kittens because apparently demons find kittens to be delicious. Spike does not feed on them. I don't think he ever did, even before he had a soul. Um, I, I, I doubt Spike went for that. But um, but demons like Clem, oh yeah, that's a big prize there. So uh, anyways, I was thinking, though, of the reason why we see this scene of him playing kitten poker um, and bringing Buffy with him at that, because we see how this is a means that Spikes acquires information because the demons around the table, they talk, you know, after, after a game or two of poker. And uh, that's how he like collects some information. So I just saw that being like very resourceful of him. And I imagine that it is something he did do from the beginning of his growth arc, as we see on Buffy. He seemed to always have this like savvy and this means of getting what he wanted, even if he didn't have money. Anyways, I just saw this as a way of like, he gets what he wants through simple means. And that was just page energy to me, I guess, you know, it's not like really going in and shaking up and he's not beating people up for the information. You know, it's a pretty like benign, innocent way of trying to acquire what it is that he's looking for. And I just really wanted to see a kitten playing poker, even though that's not literally what's happening in the show. They're playing for the kittens. There's a basket of kittens that Buffy does free at the end. So don't worry, no kittens were harmed in the filming of that scene or in the playing of that game. They all got to run free ultimately. But I, God, I just thought it'd be funny if it looked like the kitten itself was playing poker. So for the Knight of Pentacles, again, trying to stay with this sense of like groundedness, the material realm, I thought the front door of Buffy's house showed that sense of, you know, the pentacles when we think of like finances, property, very literally perhaps, but I also look at them as just like resources and that could also be intangible resources as well. And this is quoting Spike when he, after losing Buffy's trust at one point um, where he was invited into her house and could kind of come and go as he wanted to, Buffy at one point has Willow put the spell up that will block him out. But then when he regains her trust in season five and he's coming in with her, I think they're going to get weapons for the fight against Glory. He stops at the door because he, as a vampire, he, he lost his invitation inside. But then in that moment, she offers it back to him, invites him inside, and he's able to cross that threshold. And he said, no barrier. I thought of the loyalty and the dependability of the Knight of Pentacles and also being a knight, you know, a warrior moving forward and taking action for a cause we see Spike, he's being that knight about to go into battle for Buffy against Glory um, and trying to save Dawn. And so that's that's how he's he's the knight. But then that dependability, that reliability, he earned that. He earned that to get tr Buffy's trust back. And he wasn't expecting her in that moment to invite him in he was just explaining and I think he even says to her like oh if you just want to pass the weapons through the door and she's just like you know come on in so he's established himself at that point as this loyal reliable knight of pentacles who is able to cross that threshold and join her in this fight at her side and it's just beautiful and I love it and whatever that's my thought there <laughs> for the queen of pentacles to bring in a bit of a maternal nurturing energy i've got the football helmet that spike has dawn wear when she's riding behind him on the motorcycle so when buffy has died and before that point, in this moment, in this scene, when Buffy is realizing, like, 
we may not win this. Some of us may die. Promise me you'll take care of John. And he does do so when Buffy does die. And so we see him riding around town like, what is it? There's like a motorcycle demon gang that comes in to terrorize Sunnydale. And I think that's when Spike is realizing they're not really safe at uh, the Summer's house anymore. And they get on the motorcycle. And anyways, so she, she's wearing this to protect her head. He's having her <laughs> wear that as protection, as he himself is protecting her and, and, and caring for her. And so, of course, he calls her little bit as well as uh, Niblet, I think. It's just like an endearing little nickname. But um, but that's that's Spike's Queen of Pentacles side as he steps in to help care for Dawn. And of course, Willow and Tara are there as well. But um, But, you know, he remained true to his word. So, King of Pentacles, if I had to sum up Spike achieving this cumulative stage of abundance, I just saw that as his crypt. This is something that he starts designing and decorating from the jump, but we see it evolve over time into where it becomes something properly comfy, as Buffy herself describes it. It is pretty nice. And, and, and Spike is like trying to find the right word to describe it. And he's not sure if posh is the right word as he's trying to explain how nice it was to the potentials. But, uh, you know, he wasn't going to live like an animal. <laughs> he, he had his TV and his chair and he had his candles and um, his carpets. And uh, it really did become quite a nice abode. And that's a very like outward expression of his love of these creature comforts. This is why I felt like, you know, he was was the king of that domain and then he made that possible for himself and here is a little bag of groceries that I've added to his front step because sometimes we see Spike coming home with a bag of groceries and I just I love that domestic side of him <laughs> again eating food when he doesn't need food like what else is in there unless it's all filled with cigarettes I don't know but again he he, he can't breathe, so is he even getting, like, the benefits of the nicotine from the smokes? I mean, I don't know. It is a mystery. But um, but here is our King of Pentacles to finally, finally conclude this walkthrough of my Fool for Tarot deck. Thank you so much once again for sitting this out with me. If you have lasted, I don't know, <laughs> but I really appreciate it. If you did, um, I'm assuming if you did, then that you're probably as big a fan of Buffy and Spike as I am. Even if you're not Team Spuffy, hey, that's okay. You can still like Spike the character. Even for all the like hideous, horrible, immoral things that he commits, I don't know. I, I think a lot of us manage to allow the dear boy to redeem himself and realize the things that he did were so wrong. I still think it's remarkable the good moral judgment that he was able to use even when he didn't have a soul um, after time progressed and his feelings for Buffy deepened and he just wanted to make himself a better man, uh, to be more of a man ultimately than a monster. And of course, with his soul, he is better able to achieve that. Still a very flawed hero by the end, but a hero nonetheless a champion, if you will. So thank you for following me, not just on Spike's journey, but my journey in creating this deck. And I will be back to work writing up some poems for the Minor Arcana and back to share those when that is completed, but it, it, it might be a while. So, so don't hold your breath. Um, make like a vampire and don't hold your breath because you don't have breath anyway. <laughs> so <laughs> on that note, folks. <laughs>